All right, Hill, you can let people in. Hi. Hi there. Can you, good to see you. Yeah. Hey, listen, um, we have never been sent a live link for Zoom, and we're trying to uh, trying to get on not just the phone line, but uh, but uh, on the computer. Yeah, I'm on the computer. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Good. This is Monica. We're going to get started shortly, and uh, just as a Heads up, uh, participants will be muted shortly. So if you are asking questions and you're on Zoom, just use the chat. Okay, no, that's good. I just <laughs> unmuted it so I could say hello. <laughs> Absolutely, welcome. Monica, can you hear me? Yes. I can. Oh, okay, uh, this is John Stansfield, Monica. We're, uh, we never got a live link um, for Zoom. And so uh, we're, we've just been waiting for you to come on. I wonder if we can uh, if, we, if we can get one. Sure, I will email one to you right now, John. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Monica, I'm just saying hi, it's Tom. <laughs> how are you? I'm good, Tom, how are you? Good, good to see you. Good to I'm see alive. you. I'm <laughs> alive. And Sonia. Hey, and Sonia, yeah. And Harry Reid. Hey, Tom, Bruce, Get Bruce Gitlin here, how you doing? Hey, hey, Bruce, how are you? Good to hear your Great. voice. You too. Hi. Bruce. You too. hi. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it, it is 7.02, and I would like to welcome everybody to the second of our installments of the Geography of Hope series that we recently launched last week. Um, let me make sure here. All right. It's a quick little gallery view. Uh, just wanted everyone to see. I'm very excited to be joined by so many familiar faces um, and new participants. So I'm, I'm hoping you are very excited to hear from our featured speaker, Caroline, today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Monica Shear and I am the Director of Outreach here at Alaska Wilderness League. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by a number of colleagues, a number of our board members, uh, as well as our featured speaker, Caroline Van Hemert, today. Uh, I just have a few quick housekeeping items that I wanted to share with you before we get started. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So at any time during the talk today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat uh, and then we will be fielding them at the end. My colleagues are also going to be uh, monitoring the chat, answering any quick questions, clarifying questions that you might have throughout the presentation. 
as well as providing links to additional resources. We will send an email out at the end of the presentation uh, with that contains a recording for you to watch again at your leisure, as well as all the links uh, in case you are joining by phone only. So don't worry, you will get all of those resources. Um, additionally, if you would like to see the speaker featured uh, in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen, you can toggle between gallery view, which allows you to see photos of everyone, as well as um, speaker view, which will allow you to see the speakers uh, front and center. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Adam Colton, our executive director here at Alaska Wilderness League to get us started. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Monica, and, and thanks for everyone for being here. Um, you can can see behind me is uh, where I where I mentally uh, am trying to transport myself at the moment, which is to this uh, beautiful spot uh, that my our uh, wonderful uh, former board member and and and. Uh, great Arctic advocate Tom Campion uh, introduced me to uh, along the Catatürk River near the foothills of the Brooks Range in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And um, it's, uh, it's certainly a place that, that, I, that I'm thinking about among other wild landscapes as I, as I try to look for inspiration uh, during these challenging times. And, and uh, the speaker we have with us tonight and hopefully this series uh, is is one way that we at Alaska Wilderness League are trying to to give a little bit of inspiration to all of us uh, by bringing some incredible authors, uh, artists, uh, experts uh, in the wilds of Alaska to to you to your homes virtually, and uh, give you a little bit of a taste for some of the most remote and pristine wildest places left on the planet. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Alaska Wilderness League. We're the only national organization that works full time on Alaska wilderness. Um, and we have offices in Washington, D.C. And, and Anchorage, Alaska. But of course, we're not in our offices right now. I'm here in my home in Bethesda, Maryland. And it's an area of the country where, where the um, Piscataway uh, peoples uh, once, uh, once inhabited this area. And, uh, and, and we, we, uh, we we're grateful for their stewardship and and uh, uh, of these lands that that we now that we, we now inhabit and in fact the Arctic refuge behind me is is an area that has been uh, been sacred and used by the Gwich'in uh, Athabascan people and the Inupiat people uh, for for tens of thousands of years and uh, we give thanks and recognize them as well. Um, this has been um, obviously a really challenging time for, for all of us. And it's nice to have a place to come together and, and have a sense of community. And I think there's something really special about people that care about wildlife and wild places. And we may come to this for a lot of different reasons, but it's really because of that shared care, that shared passion and that commitment uh, that not only are we hopeful, uh, but we were really collectively making an incredible difference. And, you know, just uh, earlier this week, despite the pandemic, despite uh, all that's going on with the plummeting of oil markets, we heard the Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt, announced that he tends to, to try to move forward this year with a lease sale in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We've had other signals of, of attempts to move forward with uh, leasing in the Western Arctic, uh, including in some of the habitat that's important for some of the Western caribou herds that Caroline has written so beautifully about. And so unfortunately, it's, it's, it's an attempt to have business as usual, but the good news is that thanks to your efforts, thanks to our community, thanks to so many of our coalition partners and the collective energy effort, activism, and yes, your philanthropy and your support of organizations like the Alaska Wilderness League, We've had an enormous amount of success holding the line. Um, we haven't had any seismic encouragement in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge yet. We've been able to delay a lease sale. We've had nearly 2 million people weigh in directly against leasing the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We've had more, more than a dozen banks 
uh, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, many others say they won't finance any Arctic leasing. Uh, we've had just a tremendous amount of energy and activism. It's great to see that even in the midst of this crisis, even in the midst of these challenges, uh, you're making your voice heard. You're standing up for what we care about, these wild places. I, um, I want to move on to the program, but one thing I'll just say is uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to feature Caroline is not just her incredible book, uh, The Sun is a Compass, which we highly recommend. It's not coming through perfectly on the screenshot here, uh, but um, it, we also had sent you, and if you hadn't seen it, and we'll post it in the chat, her incredible op-ed in uh, that ran recently in the New York Times, and, and really uh, a hopeful piece, uh, an inspirational piece that at least spoke to me, and I hope uh, it will resonate with many of you as well, about uh, how the wilds of Alaska, how the caribou can give us sense of understanding and hope during these difficult times. And um, so with that, let me move on to the program, but again, huge thank you from all of us at Alaska Wilderness League for joining us, for your passion and commitment for wild places, for your support, for your engagement, and for joining us in making this sense of community possible. Uh, thank you. And with that, let me turn it over to my colleague who is up in, not in our office in Anchorage, but up uh, very close to there, uh, Emily Sullivan, our conservation associate up in Alaska, who will introduce our, our, our speaker and, and uh, take it from here. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, I'm Emily. I am with Alaska Wilderness League on Denaina lands in Anchorage, Alaska. And um, what drew me to this work in conservation with Alaska Wilderness League was the last decade that I spent in the interior of Alaska in um, the Denali Park area. And through my adventures on the land there and my time um, in the interior, I've developed quite an intimacy with the landscape and the ecosystem. And that's sort of what inspired me um, to come work in conservation. So um, I have read, I'm really excited to introduce Caroline to you today. Um, I've read her book and to me, one of the most inspiring parts of it was her connection to the ecosystems, the birds and the land. It was something that I found really relatable and I'm excited to hear more about from Caroline today, um, but also her adventure. So I am also, an adventure in Alaska, but my longest on foot adventure is about 200 miles and Caroline's book is about her 4000 mile adventure across um, Alaska and um, so not only inspired by her uh, connection to biology, but also her um, incredible adventures here. So she's a biologist, writer, adventurer, and her book, The Sun is the Compass, uh, received the 2019 Banff Mountain Book Competition Award for Adventure Travel, and her writing has been featured in the New York Times, Audubon, LA Times, and Outside, just to name a few. So uh, with that, Caroline, can't wait to hear from you. Right, I am going to share my screen here. Can everyone hear me? Yep, sound great. Great. Let's try that one more time. Okay, this looks right. Um, well, thank you so much for um, being here this afternoon, this evening, for those of you on, in a different time zone. Um, I'm really excited to uh, be here to uh, share my story and um, also hopefully share a bit of that sense of connection um, that Adam was just talking about a moment ago. I think that's so critical right now um, as we are all trying to navigate this, this new reality. So uh, I already got a lovely introduction from Emily. I just wanted to say a couple more things for those of you who don't know me. I'm here today in my capacity as an author, um, but I'm also a research biologist. I study birds and other critters in the North. Um, I'm an adventurer whenever I get the opportunity, and I'm a mom to two little boys who you can probably see here um, are always quite literally keeping me on my toes. I'm going to pause for one moment. Can you see the full screen? Or are you also seeing um, 
the other little window up there. Should I remove that? I am seeing full screen, so I think you're good. Perfect. Okay, I'll keep moving forward. <clears throat> so I want to return to uh, the title of this series, um, Geography of Hope. I think it says a lot because it's both very expansive and also very personal. So we all have our own geographies of hope. And um, as Adam mentioned, I uh, was able to write a piece for the New York Times recently, and I'm putting this in here not as a, a plug for myself, but um, to bring up this idea again of connection, I was really blown away by the response I got from readers uh, because I think right now we are all really looking for optimism and hope and solace that we can find very often in the natural world. And for me, this um, really resonated with an experience I had, now it's been a number of years ago in the Western Brooks Range, uh, when my husband Pat and I were on the journey I'll tell you about today, and we crossed paths with the Western Arctic caribou herd on their fall migration as they were swimming the Noatak River. And um, I think my biggest takeaway from this experience is this uh, kind of underlying sense that we have somehow to reconcile the tenuousness of our existence with the preciousness of what we, what we stand to lose. And um, I realize as Adam was speaking, this is also so true for our wild places that um, the tenuousness of them somehow makes their preciousness all the more acute. And so I wanted to just bring this idea up at the beginning of the presentation so we can sort of think forward, um, hopefully on this fun and uh, adventuresome journey, um, but that of course there are these underlying um, aspects of our existence, especially right now, um, that are much more sort of heavy and serious than um, just fun and adventure. So I wanted to um, start off by reading a short excerpt from the prologue of the book, uh, again from the Brooks Range, which is very fitting, uh, having um, heard Adam just talk about it briefly. I'm standing on the bank of the Swift Chandelar River in the Brooks Range of Northern Alaska, trying to gather the courage to swim across. My husband, Pat, is by my side. We're alone as we have been for most of the past five months. The sky is a depthless sort of overcast, no definition in the clouds, no glimmer of sunshine. The temperature hovers just above freezing and the air is damp after a night of rain. I grip the straps of my pack, my fingers raw from the chill and lean against Pat as we look down at the river that flows in a wide channel 60 feet below us. The only sound is a steady rush of moving water. I push away the voice in my head that echoes a single question. What are we doing? It's the 5th of August, 2012. Over the last 139 days, we have traversed nearly 3,000 miles, most recently through places so lightly traveled. Our topographic maps have little to say about them. Only the highest peaks are labeled, and then solely by elevation. The Brooks Range is the northernmost major mountain range on Earth and has retained its integrity in ways that few places have. Many of the creeks and valleys are nameless, their curves and riffles left unexplored. There are no soft edges here, no boardwalks or trails or park rangers. It's wild, empty, and gritty. We're here because we're attempting to travel entirely under our own power from the Pacific Northwest to a remote corner of the Alaskan Arctic. We're here because we need wilderness, like we need water or air, like we need each other. For me, this trip is also a journey back to trees and birdsong to lichen and hoof prints. Before leaving, I had lost my way on the path that carried me from biology to natural wonder. I had forgotten what it meant, not only in my mind, but in my heart to be a scientist. So I'll leave it at that um, and just show you a quick image of, oh, uh-oh. It's not letting me advance the slide. Hmm. Monica, do you have any? Need to be frozen here. Did you want to? Um... Trying to advance the slides. I wonder if you should stop my share and I'll try it again. Absolutely. We'll see if just maybe a quick. Okay. I will try again. Okay, 
So now I will show you the swim just to build the anticipation. Um, this is the river that we crossed and I'm not going to get into the specifics of exactly uh, why we did this except to say that it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but also to bring up this idea of, you know, it's often moments like this where we really realize the stakes of what we're doing. And I don't know about all of you, but I know I've had a lot of moments like that in the last couple of months with so much uncertainty and um, maybe not this really obvious acute sort of hazard that we're facing, but you know, we think a lot about um, that sense of tenuousness of, of what we love and what we care about as we're all trying to navigate um, what's truly an unprecedented time. And I think it's always worth taking a step back and thinking a little bit about why we do the things we do. And for me, uh, this trip came about in large part um, in response or maybe in reaction to my work as a biologist. So I was at a sort of professional transition point um, when we started to dream up this adventure. And um, some of you might be familiar with this problem that we've had in Alaska for now almost two decades with um, black capped chickadees and other resident species that show up with these really grossly elongated and deformed beaks. They look a bit like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Um, and you can see this little bird here. Its beak is very, very overgrown. And so I spent um, a five years and continue to work on this problem. I'm trying to understand what's causing it. And so when I started my PhD, I was really passionate about the natural world and felt very connected to the birds and to um, the environments they lived in. But the more time I spent uh, looking through a microscope and spending time in um, laboratory settings, the more and more disconnected I felt from the natural world. And so it, as I was finishing up my, my PhD, I really was questioning is, you know, is research the right um, direction for me? And so the thought of, of going outdoors and reconnecting with um, what had drawn me to science in the first place seemed like the, the logical answer. Maybe the 4,000 miles was less logical, but it was, um, again, a response to, to my kind of disillusionment with science and with, with research at that time. And then personally, uh, there was also a kind of a big transition happening for both um, Pat and I. Uh, we were in our early 30s, no longer um, quite so young as we once were in thinking about things like having a family and you know, some of those bigger life decisions. And um, another thing that had happened around the same time that really changed my, my sense of, of urgency was that my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And um, as I'm sure many of you have had some um, direct experiences with that, it's a degenerative neurologic disease. And um, suddenly this person who I'd always looked to as kind of my mentor and, and this pillar of both physical strength and, and emotional and, and psychological strength was um, himself facing a really uncertain future. And so this sense of you know, doing what we care most deeply about um, when we have the opportunity suddenly seemed um, really necessary. And this was not the first trip that Pat and I had taken together or their first adventure um, in Northern uh, wilderness. I actually met Pat, uh, he was a roommate to my younger sister in college in Bellingham. And, and I'd heard about this, this kid from New York of all places who had come to Alaska as a 19 year old um, to build a cabin deep in the Alaskan interior and spend a winter alone. And I thought, wow, this is a, this is a guy I need to meet. This, is, <laughs> this sounds like really hard to believe, but it, in fact, it was true. And he, you can see that the pictures there on the top left, that's his little cache um, where he stored his food. And then um, there I am peeking out of the cabin door that he built. Um, and this was one of our first kind of extended dates together. And, and from that point forward, we started taking on um, all kinds of, of different backcountry adventures. And the mode of transportation varied a lot and as did the setting. But I think one thing that was really consistent throughout was our connection to wilderness and um, our interest in taking on uh, challenges that really pushed us out of our comfort zones. And uh, so when the opportunity arose to take on something bigger than we ever had, um, we started dreaming um, probably for at least a couple of years. And this is the, the route that we came up with. I won't get too much into the specifics of it, but happy to answer questions. Uh, at the end, we started down in Bellingham, Washington, just north of Seattle, and rode, took rowboats up the Inside Passage to um, just outside of Haines, Alaska, where we transitioned to skis and pack rafts, and um, went up and over the Coast Mountain Range into the headwaters of the Yukon River, paddled by canoe down the Yukon, 
and then headed north and east um, over the Tombstone Mountains and up into the um, Peel and the Mackenzie River and eventually to the Mackenzie Delta, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, shortly. It was a very memorable place, though maybe not for all of the right reasons. And then we headed west along the Arctic coast um, into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, um, as Adam mentioned earlier. And at the village of Kaktovik, uh, we took a sharp turn to the south and headed um, down and through the center of the refuge and then uh, more or less along the crest of the Brooks Mountain Range uh, until we reached the Noatak River and paddled that to um, the Chukchi Sea and eventually to Kotzebue. So it took us about six months in total um, used a variety of modes of transportation, as you probably already gathered. We took rowboats um, up the inside passage, then skis and pack rafts. And I imagine some people on this call are familiar with pack rafts, but for those of you who aren't, they're these really incredible little inflatable boats that only weigh about seven or eight pounds fully loaded. And the beauty of them is you can roll them up and put them in your backpack. And so it allows you to be amphibious on the landscape. And in a place like Alaska, um, especially in the Arctic, it's really quite critical to have that ability because there aren't really trails and roads and, and bridges like you might find other places. And so being able to transition from boating to walking and, and back to boating allows you to go places you otherwise couldn't. Um, we canoed a section of the Yukon River and also a section of the Noatak River. And then for many of those miles, uh, we were just wearing lightweight hiking shoes and, and pounding them out by, by foot. So I want to show you a short video clip um, that hopefully gives you a little sense of some of the places and um, critters we had the good fortune to see along the way. Bellingham Bay uh, setting out in the middle of March was actually St. Patrick's Day that we left. And there's one thing that I should tell you about the rowing portion of the journey. Um, and that was that neither of us knew how to row when we left. And this was not by design. Uh, it was uh, one of those things that we had much better intentions when we started planning, but it turned out um, that getting expedition style rowboats that just were not commercially available. And so Pat ended up taking this on as his night job, building um, the rowboats from scratch. And so by the time they were ready to go, uh, we were also ready to go. And so uh, this was the second day that, that my boat had been in water. Um, fortunately, it was a um, steep learning curve, but the boats were pretty forgiving and we slowly sort of figured out how it is to travel backwards with these big unwieldy oars as we um, made our way north through uh, what was quite stormy weather at times. 
Monica, I'm sorry, it's freezing on me again. I'm gonna to have to have you stop and I'll reshare. And I did just see a quick question come through on the okay. chat while you're doing that. Yeah. So uh, someone asked, uh, they weren't able to catch the first episode last week in that kicked off our series, Geography of Hope. So yes, uh, you are able to watch that one and I will be sure that we include a link to the recording in uh, the email that we send around. Um, and it featured Kristen Gates um, and her film, Sacred Place. Hmm. Still not letting me dance. You wanna stop again, Monica, and try it once more? Okay, next slide, at least for now. <laughs> um, so because it was the middle of March when we left, um, for anyone who spent any time on the Pacific coast, you know that's a really stormy time of year. So there were quite a few days we were stuck on shore uh, looking out at, at the water and, and wondering how much we could handle and um, maybe more importantly, how much the boats could handle. This was a day uh, toward the end of the inside passage. It was 35 degrees and sleeting and we made the discovery that rubber dishwashing gloves are actually pretty essential equipment for um, rowing in these kinds of conditions. But of course, there's an upside to everything. And uh, for us uh, on this portion of the trip, it was the fact that spring is such an incredibly productive time of year um, on the Pacific coast. But as probably most of you know, just about anywhere, uh, we had the um, company of sea lions and uh, lots of bears coming out of hibernation mountain goats, uh, whales returning from their breeding grounds in Hawaii and Mexico, and lots and lots of birds, which for me as an ornithologist um, and, a, and a scientist, this was probably the greatest gift of all that I um, had had a lot of time with uh, birds on one end of their migratory pathway or the other, but to actually see how they moved across the landscape, which it turned out in some cases quite similarly to, to us. This is a big flock of surf scoters um, gathering to feed on on the herring spawn in Lynn Canal. And we followed these birds all the way up and over the mountains to the Arctic coast. And this was a case for a number of species that we got to hopscotch with them as uh, we were both making our own journeys, although they had a bit of an advantage with um, flight. <laughs> we were moving a lot slower and uh, more clumsily throughout the, the trip. I don't know why it is freezing again. Okay, we'll try this. Um, I'll try playing and if that keeps happening, I could just stay out of the full screen mode. Yeah, we'll have to try again, fortunately. Right, I'm just gonna stay, I think, in this mode for now to avoid having to uh, toggle in and out. Okay, and so our first destination on our trip um, was this cabin that Pat and I built uh, just outside of Haines, Alaska on Lynn Canal. And um, as you can imagine, after being in the stormy uh, spring weather, the thought of coming here and then leaving again was uh, really quite difficult to stomach. We were really enjoying the, the couch and the wood stove and the hot coffee, um, but we knew that with the fickle weather of Southeast Alaska, as soon as we got a window that looked like this, we had no choice but to keep going. And so our plan all along was to leave our rowboats here at the cabin and head up and over the mountains um, into across the Canadian border and into the headwaters of the Yukon River. And you can see on the skyline here, this prominent notch um, that is the pass that we'll be traveling up and over. And from a different perspective, uh, you can see that weather, the beautiful bluebird weather didn't last quite as long as we were hoping. And um, by the time I got up uh, cresting that pass there, uh, it had become a lot more stormy. 
And in fact, that spring, we had a lot of uh, late season snowfall and it turned out that the route that we were planning uh, was a lot less uh, safe and stable than we had originally hoped. And Carolyn, so we, um, yep. we can't see your pictures. So I just oh, want no. to that okay. she's not showing them. Sorry, y'all. Yeah, so we're gonna just move forward with um, Caroline's talk so that we don't have to keep freeze for right now. <laughs> Sorry. Is it not, the share is not working? Oh, oh, were you sure? I thought you weren't. Oh, there you go, okay. Okay. I thought you weren't sharing. Gotcha. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So did you see, um, I don't know where it left. There's the cabin. Perfect. <laughs> uh, there's the pass. You can see the, the skyline there, the notch. And then there is um, me coming up over that pass, uh, realizing that um, the avalanche conditions were a whole lot worse than we were um, hoping for. And so we had to come up with a different alternative for going um, around and into the headwaters of the um, Yukon River by way of Tagish Lake. And I don't think my pointer will show up here, but we're basically going from the, the far left of your screen um, across the glaciers to the kind of top right corner, which is Tagish Lake. And so as you can imagine, trying to um, renegotiate a route over the mountains that we did not have a whole lot of information about um, proved to be a little bit challenging. And one of the biggest challenges is that it forced us to come off of one glacier and back onto another. And it's often these transition places that have, as Emily can attest to, that um, this is usually a place you want to avoid if you um, possibly can, because they look something like this, where it's not good for skiing, it's not good for paddling, um, and nor is it very good for walking. But fortunately, we were able to make it up and um, back onto the ice. And this put us uh, on, um, ice field heading over to uh, the Tagish Lake there by way of um, the Canadian border. And I think I'm going to come out of the uh, full screen just in hopes it won't freeze again while I do a short reading. So this was um, one of the rare glimpses we had of the mountains around us. Most of the time we were up there, it was uh, pretty stormy and, and socked in and um, not a whole lot to look at. And uh, one of the sort of resounding feelings I had, I remember after coming off of the coast and getting up into this land of snow and ice was just this overwhelming sense of, of quiet and almost loneliness. We'd had so many uh, companions along the whole inside passage and all of a sudden here we are, um, just us in, in uh, frozen landscape and no critters uh, to speak of. But then we had a, an experience that kind of changed my perspective of that and I wanna share that briefly. And Monica, I'll get started. If anything, um, if you need to interrupt me at any time, if things aren't showing up, just let me know, but I'll assume they're okay. <laughs> okay. Gradually, the sky opens just enough to reveal a glacial lake shimmering in the mist to our left. Ice shines through the clear water and a rock is perched near its edge. As I get closer, the rock turns its head and is no longer the color of stone. What was gray from a distance has become white. I blink and reach for my binoculars. Through glass, I see a shocking scene. At nearly 5,000 feet on a broad ice field, a trumpeter swan is taking a bath. A world away from the lowland ponds and lakes where it breeds, far from the plants it must eat to power its flight, the bird appears perfectly at home. It looks over at us, stretches its long neck toward the sky, then continues its ablutions. The surprise sighting reminds me to look up more frequently, and soon I realize that we have joined a procession of other travelers. First, I notice a small flock of swallows as they fight against the fierce headwind. The birds toggle back and forth to switch back into the gusts. When the clouds lift above the mountaintops, I see a hawk catch a thermal and rise into the gray sky. Soon, other migrants pass. Shorebirds call overhead. A flock of geese soars high above us. Suddenly, this place feels much less deserted. It occurs to me then that our route is a logical flyway for birds heading inland from the Pacific coast. It's no accident that we're all following this path of least resistance, a low point in an otherwise jagged range, a toothy gap in the barricade of the coast mountains. From Lynn Canal, birds funnel up the Katsahine River and over the mountains, just as we have. As we watch, I marvel at the fact that they know which path to follow. How do they find their way over oceans and glaciers, across continents and mountain ranges, without the benefit of a map, compass, or GPS? 
Here among the ice and snow lies a magic that is hard to capture through textbooks or journal articles or the blue screen of my computer. For individual birds, there is nothing formulaic about migration. Each season is different, every journey unique. To get to their breeding grounds, birds chance everything in an ordinary act that is by any measure extraordinary. And so this was uh, one of those moments along um, the trip that I suddenly felt reconnected to um, science and, and to the natural world and, and to just the simple act of observation, which is really the foundation of, um, I think, engagement with the natural world, but also the foundation of science that we very often forget because we get so hung up on you know, analyses and spreadsheets and, and all of the things that, that are necessary for science, but sometimes just that very simple act of observation can be so central to our experience and our engagement with um, the things that we study. So um, here I am coming down the other side of the mountains um, along the shores, I think in this case of, of Marsh Lake. And unshare, please. <laughs> Okay, thanks for everyone's patience. I don't know why it's doing this. Here we go. To, um, the, to Whitehorse and the Yukon River. And so this was the, the one part of our trip that really marked a, a bit of a vacation um, sense in that we're able to pick up a cheap rental canoe and as you can see, load it with just about anything we could possibly want, including lots of chocolate chip cookies and, and chips and a box of wine and all those luxuries that we hadn't had as we were carrying our loads up and over the mountains. Um, the other uh, real luxury of this portion of the trip is that there was so little route finding involved and a lot of um, certainty compared to everywhere where else we had been. We knew that we would let the river take us um, where it did and that was the right direction. And we were pretty excited to start the next part of the journey. This was up and over the Tombstone Mountains and then into the, the headwaters of um, the Wind River. And the Wind River was a place that for us uh, had a lot of um, nostalgia and a lot of really good memories and maybe some not so good memories too, but we're all good at blocking those out of our minds. So this was the site of uh, the very first formative adventure that Pat and I took together. Um, almost exactly 10 years prior to uh, the trip I'm talking about today. And it was about maybe nine months after we'd met, we hiked into the headwaters of the Wind River in Northern Yukon um, with the intention of building a birch bark canoe. And what could possibly go wrong, right, on a, a trip like that? Well, it turned out there were a lot of things that, that could and did go wrong. Um, one of the first ones being that I didn't really know how to pack for a 60 day trip. I thought, ah, oh, 2000 you know, calories per person per day. You look at the back of the Snickers bar or whatever, that seems about right. Um, well, it turns out that when you're exerting yourself as anyone who's actually packed for a backcountry trip knows that you need a lot more than that to, to keep yourself going. So we ended up very, very hungry. Um, the trail in turned out not really to be a trail, and so it was uh, a lot slower and, and more arduous than expected. But the biggest problem of all was the fact that um, despite all of my good researcher tendencies to look for um, where birch trees would be on the landscape, uh, the vegetation maps that I had uh, previewed turned out to be wrong, and there was not a single birch tree uh, at the headwaters of the Wind River. And so building a birch bark canoe um, out of non-existent birch trees uh, turned out to be a bit of a challenge. And uh, what we ended up doing instead was building a spruce bark canoe. And that's a story for another time. But I think the takeaway for us in coming back here a decade later was just this really strong sense of adventure and of um, connection to each other and connection to um, what had almost become like a third partner in our marriage, which was um, wilderness. To unshare. This time around, we were doing it in very different style, uh, much more um, lightweight with uh, pack rafts and this time with enough food to keep us going. And things were, were really moving along pretty well. We felt like we'd found our momentum um, after transitioning from being in boats and then on skis to being on foot and pack raft. Um, and that was the case until we reached the Mackenzie Delta. 
And this is a satellite image of the delta. And uh, as you might correctly surmise, it does not look like the most ideal place for paddling. And in fact, it was not. Um, before leaving, we'd been warned that it's a muddy delta and there's a lot of bugs and um, it's pretty flat water paddling, which is not ideal for these little pack rafts that kind of act like rubber duckies that can um, get blown any direction by the wind. Um, but we thought, ah, you know, we've, we've done lots of trips in Alaska's backcountry, northern Canada, like how bad could it really be? Well, it turned out pretty bad. Um, and rather than try to explain to you exactly what that looked like, I'm going to share, hopefully, in just a moment. <laughs> but um, you jumped me out of there again, Monica, a little video. to tell you um, what a relief it was to reach the Arctic coast when we finally did, um, largely because the coastal breeze kept the mosquitoes at bay and it felt like we could see for the first time in, in weeks because we weren't wearing head nets and didn't have the, uh, the unshare. didn't have the distraction of bugs buzzing all around our face constantly. Um, but more than anything, it was because uh, for those of you who've had the opportunity to spend any One time- One sec, Caroline, sorry, oh. the share didn't come through real oh, quick. Sure. Sorry, thanks. Thank you, thanks for letting me know. For those of you who've had um, the pleasure of spending any time on the Arctic coast or in the Arctic in general, um, you'll know that from a wildlife perspective, it is unlike anywhere else on earth. And so to suddenly um, be surrounded by all these incredible critters was really quite an incredible, uh, sorry, could you unshare? I'm, like, I'm just gonna give you a thumbs up when I need you to unshare because, <laughs> thanks. Okay. And as we traveled west along the Arctic coast, we did a combination of, of paddling, as you can see here, and then hiking. And you might have noticed in that, that earlier video clip I showed you, um, that scene of just an incredible amount of driftwood, uh, which to me was a, a total surprise to be in this treeless landscape, seeing just miles and miles of, of really um, stacked upon driftwood. And so it, it was, it's one of those places, the, the Arctic coast, that defies almost every expectation you might have. And this was just one of them, that these trees are traveling in some cases from hundreds, if um, not you know, a thousand miles or more, to land up here, um, deposited by the wind and, and the waves. At times we're hiking along this, these sections of, of shore fast ice. And then, as I mentioned, once we got to the village of Kaktovik, we took a sharp turn to the south and, and headed inland. And this is across the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And 
the real key uh, for traveling in this part of the world, um, this is maybe the one place where I occasionally ask people for their input so you could type it into the, the comments real quick if you have any thoughts about what you might be looking at here um, in terms of, of how you might find your way across this landscape. And I imagine there's a number of people with some good guesses. Well, these, um, these are the trails of caribou, uh, which really are the, the one and only way to um, travel efficiently across what is truly a vast and, and at times can feel like a pretty impenetrable uh, landscape. And so we would follow these trails that have been worn into the tundra for, for thousands of years um, up and over uh, these you know, incredible ridges down across rivers. And we very quickly uh, learned to trust the caribou's intuition over our own on the um, few occasions where we thought, oh, you know, this looks like a, a better route. We don't really want to cross the river. It's cold and um, looks kind of uh, fast moving here. Uh, time and time again, we would learn that, um, in fact, the caribou did know the right way to travel. And, and so this was a lesson that, that um, quickly became apparent to us that um, the caribou know something that we don't. And this is also a, a place where we had sort of the combined sense of feeling very small on this immense landscape um, and also kind of infinite. We'd been covering sometimes 20 or 30 or um, even more miles in a day, you know, across this trailless uh, landscape and probably as strong as we ever had been and, and maybe ever will be in our lives and really traveling uh, like animals. And so the thought of making it to our destination, which initially had felt like this kind of nebulous end, um, and you know, we didn't really know if it was even possible, was suddenly feeling within reach. And um, I guess as often happens when you get too confident in, or maybe uh, even a little bit cocky, that's when we started to run into problems. Um, the first was the rain. We had about three weeks straight of pretty heavy rain, which is really quite rare um, in this part of, of the Arctic, which is technically a, a polar desert because they get so little precipitation in a year. And so just crossing rivers became really difficult. The whole landscape was saturated, making things like um, cooking with open fire really difficult and um, not to mention wet and miserable. And then the next problem we had was an encounter with a predatory black bear. And at this point we had met dozens of bears and for the most part had, you know, had pretty controlled encounters with them. Occasionally we got a little closer than we would have liked, but we'd really never had a problem um, up to this, this point. And we were coming out of a, a clearing um, or coming into a clearing out of a really brushy section uh, when I heard this rustling behind me and I, I turned thinking it was a, a jay or some kind of larger bird and saw this black bear staring at me. And um, in that instant, I knew without doubt that this bear had different intentions than any bear I had ever met. And so I've had a lot of bear safety training um, over the years as part of my work and, and um, recreational experiences. And uh, I always wondered if I met a predatory bear, would I, would I know it? And it turned out the answer was um, unquestionably yes. And so this turned into a, about a 30 minute standoff um, with us doing everything in our power to defend ourselves and the bear um, approaching us again and again. And in the end, it, it decided that it wasn't probably worth the trouble uh, of eating us or whatever it had in mind. Uh, and we were able to make a break for the nearest river and, and escape. But as you can imagine, it left us pretty shaken after feeling really comfortable in bear country um, and having lived outside at that point for more than five months. The next problem we ran into was snow. So the same um, rain that was falling down low was falling as snow up high. And this was the, the very last pass we had to cross to get into um, the headwaters of the, the Noatak River, which would um, kind of mark the last section of our journey. And this was, um, I think, the third attempt to get over. And as you can see, it's snowy um, and it's slippery and, and we're not prepared for mountaineering type conditions. And so we finally had to accept that it just wasn't possible uh, to make it over this pass and uh, had to find an alternative route down and around the mountains, which um, ended up taking a lot longer and being a really unknown um, 
part of our route because we were literally walking off of the maps that we carried with us in hopes of finding an alternative. We finally did. Um, this was what we faced on our final descent. So you can see all this big um, snow and ice covered talus that made for a pretty slow and painful descent, but unfortunately um, we're able to do it mostly safely besides a few um, bruised body parts. And so when we got down to the um, No Attack Valley, it really felt like we had arrived. We'd made it all but the last section um, down the No Attack River. And all we had left to do was to pick up um, a final food resupply before making our way um, out to the Chukchi Sea and into the end of our journey. Thanks. And Caroline, can you just remind people where you were uh, for like the bear encounter um, in, in the Brooks, I'm guessing? <laughs> sure. Yep. That was the Western Brooks Range um, Thank you. in the gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve. And um, like all well laid plans, this one didn't quite work out as we had hoped. So we had one. Um, source of air support on the whole trip and this was uh, at the headwaters of the no attack river where we were waiting for um, a, a plane to deliver the last of our food resupply and a foldable canoe that we would use for for boating down the no attack we we're hoping not to repeat our experience with pack rafts um, after being on the mckenzie delta there and um, it almost turned disastrous uh, because the plane could not get to us. That same um, bad weather that we'd had for weeks on end um, continued. And so we were stuck waiting in the tent um, for what turned out to be uh, quite a few days with no food after our reserves were already stretched pretty thin. I'm gonna read a short excerpt from that. And I'm guessing Monica, you'll have to um, unshare me once I'm done with that. For the first time, I understand what a chickadee must experience each night the temperature drops well below freezing, and its survival hinges on the slightest of reserves. To persist in temperatures of 30 or even 50 degrees below zero, these tiny birds burn through 10% of their body weight and fat simply to make it through another day. There is no time to waste during the short daylight hours of a subarctic winter. Every moment is spent in pursuit of food. At night, they find cavities in trees and enter a state of torpor, which allows their metabolism to slow and their core temperature to drop, preserving only the most vital of functions. As humans, we can't enter torpor, nor are we familiar with a threshold between hunger and starvation. I know only that we need food, and soon. By the end of the third day, we occupy a hazy space between waking and dreaming. Just climbing out of the tent feels like an expedition. I've never been so weak before, had my mind so clouded by hunger. I waver between periods of heart thumping anxiety, followed by the sort of acceptance that borders on defeat. I would considered the possibility of dying on this trip, but I'd never imagined it might be here like this. After facing avalanche prone slopes and a predatory bear, floundering in an icy river and flipping a raft in the Arctic Ocean, starvation seemed like the most improbable of ends. It had never crossed my mind that we might face a slow and plodding death where terror comes not from blood and gore or bodies swept away in a cold current, but from the endless act of waiting. It's easy to be critical from a distance to assume that mishaps are an avoidable result of bad judgment, but suddenly we have found ourselves in a similar situation. So again, spoiler alert, right? I'm here and <laughs> got safely um, with our kids somewhere. Um, the plane did finally come and we got our food resupply, but it was certainly a, a very humbling experience after having been um, more or less self-reliant for, for so many miles and so many, so many days to, to suddenly be stuck waiting and realizing that we really were um, quite vulnerable there. And so we were pretty ready to get on our way. Uh, and it was only a couple of days before we had an experience that suddenly made the fact of being stuck and, and waiting seem like um, maybe it was uh, for a reason. 
And that was because we had the opportunity to cross paths with the Western Arctic caribou herd on their fall migration. And I'll share a clip from that to unshare me again. keeps coming by here, crossing. It's probably the single most exciting thing we've seen on the whole trip. Pretty incredible. Try again. Okay, I think we're we're coming here. Sorry, thanks for your patience, everyone. So I, um, I hope you enjoyed that little video clip. And I, I guess I wanted to just take a minute to think where we are now and how the experience of, of being among the caribou continues to resonate with me um, in a very different place, both in my life and um, physically, and share a little bit from um, the piece I wrote for the New York Times uh, just recently. And so I'll end with that that reading and um, again I really appreciate everyone being here and and um, joining me in the evening we set up camp on a nearby island as dusk fell we sat in silence with our shoulders pressed together and watched the steady stream of animals crossing later as I lay in my sleeping bag in the dark I heard them plot splashing still by morning the caribou were gone we set off down the Noatak River again, each paddle stroke carrying us closer to the Chukchi Sea and the end. We understood in principle that it wasn't possible to disappear into the northern wilderness for half a year and come back unchanged. What we couldn't envision was what this return might look like in practice. Suddenly, I knew it didn't matter. There are some things we can't understand until we live them. To have been among the caribou was all the closure I would ever need. Like all of us, I'm grasping for connection in a time of uncertainty. I hear the school bell ring down the street and listen reflexively for the children's voices that don't come. I stand six feet from my sister and feel the void stretch deep and aching between us. I hug my children close because I still can. And then I shut my eyes and imagine the caribou bedded down in the snow, trusting the sun to rise and warm their backs knowing that the night will pass. We are not caribou. We don't pound our hooves against the earth each spring and fall in search of food and shelter. We can't survive on frozen lichen in the warmth of our fur coats. Mosquitoes and wolves aren't our greatest foes. The ordinary facts of our human lives do matter, 
and deeply. But even now, when I most want to believe in happy endings, I find myself turning toward the harshness of an Arctic river. In the wild eyes of a floundering calf separated from its mother, in the bleached white skull of last season's casualty, I take solace in simply being present. The caribou remind me that we must reconcile the tenuousness of our existence with the preciousness of what we stand to lose. In the end, perhaps we aren't so different from the caribou crossing the river. As we struggle against the current, we're buoyed by the fact that we're not alone. We greet our neighbors on the screen, through windows, at distances that feel strained and unnatural, and exchange silent blessings, recognizing that for us, like for caribou, community is everything. Even cloistered in our own invisible bubbles, we sense the momentum of the herd pouring down the hillside. We know that there is no one to save us except ourselves. By gathering the courage to jump, waiting for the shock of the cold water to pass, and feeling the ripples of our individual choices, we begin to move as one. To survive together, we must be brave. We must be compassionate. We must learn when to step forward as leaders and when to step aside so others can pass safely. And during those moments when fear steals my breath, I will remember the steam rising from the backs of caribou, see the mothers plunging boldly into the cold water with their calves by their sides, and let myself believe that we too can find our way. So this is my last slide and um, yeah, I thank you all so much. Um, you, oh, maybe you can't see it, let's see. <laughs> And with a real punch there, the invisible screen. Okay. So in case you're wondering um, what we're up to these days, these are my kiddos um, on some sailing adventures we've had the opportunity to do. Um, not real recently, but hopefully again before too long. And yeah, I'd be glad to continue the conversation um, with all of you. And thanks again so much for uh, your patience and for being here. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. That was... Um truly fit our, our goal of taking our minds somewhere else right now and really instilling a sense of hope um, in all of us. I know I speak for myself that even just listening to your words there at the end um, were just wonderful. And so really do appreciate all of your time and sharing so many of your unique experiences. Um, and so quickly, I just wanted to turn it over now to Chris Konish, our Director of Development, to talk a little bit more about the League. And then um, I know Emily has uh, two questions um, quickly that folks have popped in that we'll get to the chat and then um, wrap it up. So Chris, I'll share my screen and turn it over to you. Thanks, Monica. And, and thanks so much, everyone, for, for just being a part of this. Um, I've been fortunate to sort of scroll through the participants and seeing a lot of familiar uh, names, which is always great to see, um, including some of our partners, the Northern Alaska Environmental Center and the Wilderness Society, um, and a number of my, my colleagues on staff, which is always good to see um, sort of after hours here. Um, we just wanted to give people an opportunity to sort of see that there is an opportunity chance for, for each one of you to connect on our issues and to take a step towards protecting these areas that were highlighted here today, as well as a lot of the areas highlighted throughout this Geography of Hope series. Um, one of the easiest ways to do so is become a contributing member or contribute additional financial resources to these causes. You know, there's a lot of opportunities to engage in our work. Um, a lot of the staff on our, our team, all of the staff on our team are doing such incredible work. Your support truly makes a difference to make sure these areas remain protected. Um, another one is, is to take action, participate in our work from, in, from an activist standpoint. Um, the team put together a great grassroots toolkit that you can find a link to here on the slide as well as in follow-up notes soon. Um, there's a number of different actions you can take place that'll be highlighted initially there. Um, and I believe uh, we're looking at something with regards to the corporate campaign as well. Um, and then follow us on social media. You know, we, we have Facebook accounts. Uh, Emily here on the, on the channel is running our Instagram page. Um, and also, we're very active on Twitter. I encourage you to find us online, reach out, connect with us, um, and make sure that we're still continuing to forge these connections at a time of isolation. Um, again, really, really, really appreciate everyone from joining 
Um, and we also have some information about some of the upcoming events as well as some specific uh, events for our supporters uh, that we'll be rolling out soon, one of which we'll be announcing with um, a longtime Alaska board member, Alaska Wilderness League board member, Debbie Miller, as well as uh, later in the, later next month, uh, David Thorson, who's gonna be doing a terrific presentation. So really encourage folks to join. If you're not already a member, please step up. And uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you again. Thank you, Chris. And now, um, Emily, as I mentioned, I saw, I know a number of the questions were kind of answered uh, throughout your presentation, Caroline, about what it was like to go without food, which you went into in depth, but um, there were a few. So, uh, Emily, turn, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, um, the, Caroline, there was a question about um, how your adventures and home life changed since having two boys. Um, and the asker of the question, as well as those of us who have followed some of your other writing know that you take them on a lot of adventures. So it was a little bit about that. Sure. Um, yeah, so it certainly changed a lot uh, in some ways, but I think that the thing that we've retained um, as a family is trying to spend as much time as we can in um, places that give us that sense of, of inspiration and um, it can mean very small scale adventures and uh, we've done some larger scale adventures more recently um, incorporating boats as our kids are getting heavier uh, and they're mobile but not quite as mobile as uh, you know we're used to being able to travel. Um, we did a trip sailing up the Inside Passage um, a couple of summers ago and so yeah incorporating sailboat into some of our adventures has been one way. And I'm always amazed to how um, having kids as guides can really open your eyes up or my eyes, I guess I speak for myself, um, to things that I, I don't always notice. You know, we, I talked a lot on this trip about covering miles and covering ground, but sometimes staying put um, allows for a really different perspective and having two young um, guides in that sense is, yeah, been a gift too. And then there was another question about um, the logistics planning for your um, big trip, which I know you go into a little bit in the book, but just um, kind of a little bit more about if you could expand a little bit on how um, your logistics planning was in addition to food mapping. Um, how long did you guys spend prepping in that way? Yeah, it, as you can imagine, it was a um, really time consuming task. Uh, I, I always feel this um, sense of kind of urgency to get out in the springtime. And I remember having that feeling so strongly the spring we were getting ready to go. So we were spending all of our time, you know, in the basement, packing Ziploc bags full of oatmeal and these things that seem um, not all that rewarding in the moment, but are so essential to making um, something like that possible. And I would say we started planning in earnest about a year before the trip. We started dreaming long before that. Um, and then, you know, the actual like packing and prep, probably about six months um, leading up to it. And so it was a combination of trying to kind of acquire the big picture um, route plan or route map and then honing in on the specific areas that we thought might trip us up the most. So we would, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, Emily, with your own um, trip planning, but there's you know, a bit of a triage approach, I think, uh, because there's no way that you will ever have everything done in time um, to the level of detail that you would like. And I'm definitely a real planner and a list maker. And um, I've had to learn to let go of some of that um, in favor of figuring out, okay, what's, what's the essence of this that we need to know that is going to prevent this from being possible. So I think relying on um, other people who'd been to some of these places before um, and then local knowledge is, you know, trumps everything. So when we would get to a community, people were almost universally um, welcoming and, and open to us, particularly um, when we learned to talk about the landscape in terms that were relevant to them. So they don't really care, you know, somebody doesn't necessarily care that you came from Bellingham or whatever grand thing you're setting out to do, but they do care that you traveled down a river that they have, you know, been traveling on for their entire lifetime. So we, we definitely relied really heavily on um, local knowledge to figure out some of those tricky points that we did not have information about in advance. Um, the next question and probably our last question is, um, did you take notes or journal on the trip? I did. Yeah, I, um, most days I journaled uh, and I'm actually a really slow handwriter. So it sounds a whole lot less romantic than, you know, keeping a, a beautiful um, journal, but I 
I had this little roll up keyboard that weighed about three ounces and I could pair it with a, a phone that we were carrying with us so that we could get Wi-Fi when we went through communities. And so I actually typed into that and um, could back up my notes along the way. I will say that it was, it was more like a naturalist log. I don't think anything in the, the journal actually found its way into the book um, directly, except as uh, the, the beauty of not starting from a blank page, which goes a long way in <laughs> starting a writing project. But yeah, I did. And I, I referenced a lot of, um, you know, the details from the journal. But... Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, I think those are all our questions. Adam? Caroline, thank you. Uh, that was really, um, really a, a lift I think all of us needed. And uh, I can't, can't encourage folks enough if you already haven't um, to to go ahead and um, and and make sure to get a sun is uh, is a compass uh, wherever you like to buy your books um, local bookstores that are selling online or, or on Amazon but a tremendous book and again thank you for all of you for being with us for for kind of helping bring a, a little uh, sense of community. Um, sharing in this wonderful inspiration. Thank you for being part of the Alaska Wilderness League family for all the ways that you support uh, Alaska Wilderness League and our work. And hopefully you'll follow up on what Chris encouraged, which is to think about uh, ways to become a member if you aren't, uh, ways to engage in the fight for wild Alaska and um, ways to follow us on so social media. And, and please do consider joining us for some of the other events in our special Geography of Hope series. Again, thanks. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Emily. Thanks to the rest of our team. Thanks to Las Willis League Board and Leadership Council members who are on. And most of all, thank you, Caroline, for that incredibly inspiring, wonderful presentation. Have a great evening and hope to see you next time. Yeah, thanks everyone. It was a pleasure.